focused on some verses in 1 Corinthians 15. Summarized, they say, And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all of men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead. Thank you. We want to go again to uh, Numbers chapter 21 here this morning. Uh, I shouldn't say again because we are actually going to Numbers 21 for the first time. Uh, but we're going again to Numbers as we uh, um, continue on the journey with the nation of Israel. Uh, a reminder, certainly, uh, this is more than a narrative of history for us in the Old Testament. Uh, the New Testament reminds us that it was written for our benefit, for our advantage, for our gaining, our learning. Uh, and so this is not just a historical narrative uh, that we're reviewing. There are, there's points that we need to learn. But as well, we have to be reminded because it is Old Testament, because it is directed to the Jews, because it is directed before the cross. Uh, certainly there are incidences, instances where, or incidents uh, that take place in interactions with God that are different then than they are now. And uh, so we have to keep that in mind as we're going through this. Uh, but I think there's some amazing... Uh, uh, points here as we begin Numbers chapter 21, especially as we ref reference it back to Numbers chapter 14. But before we do, let's begin with the word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you again for your word. I thank you for uh, these couple of verses we're going to go over here this morning. I pray again that you allow me to decrease, that you alone would increase. I pray that you would allow the message to be clear to each one of us, that we'd be able to learn what needs to be learned from, from the truths from the past. But I pray as well that we be reminded of a God who never changes. And we thank you for that very truth. I, I pray that we be able to, to grasp what it is to truly depend upon you in our lives and in our actions and our, even in our thinking. And uh, I just pray that we would follow after you and that you would lead us as we do. And we give you the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen found an illustration that fits, I think, the, the message quite simply. And uh, I have to honestly attest to the fact that while I have never worked in a textile mill, uh, I could see this, this illustration could be me and probably many of us. Uh, and so I don't share this with my finger wagging, my head shaking, and how could you do such a thing? Because uh, this literally could be probably any of us, if certainly not me, or is, including me. But the story is told of a new employee who was hired at that textile mill, and in her training she was told, if your thread ever gets tangled, stop and get a foreman. 
And in fact, as she was given the tour and then assigned her station, there on a sign right above her workstation was literally in the same words, if your thread ever gets tangled, call, stop, and call the foreman. Well, on her first day, sure enough, her thread got tangled. In fact, she hadn't been there very long at all. And she found that her thread was tangled. But it didn't look like that bad of a tangle. So it was certainly something that she could probably resolve and not have to bother somebody. How embarrassing it would be uh, to only have this job for you know a minimal amount of time and then already find yourself having to shut down and call somebody to help fix you and straighten you out. And uh, so she tried to uh, uh, just, just resolve the situation as best she could. Which, what she quickly determined was that the more that she tried, the worse that it got. And before long, it was just a, a, a complete mess, and she had to basically call the shutdown, and the foreman came over, and kind of with tear, eye, tear, tears in her eyes and kind of a, a lump in her throat, she, she apologized and said that she did the best that she could, but it obviously wasn't working. And the foreman just shook his head at her and put his finger up at the sign and said, this was the best that you could have done. This right here is what you should have done. By doing the best that you could, you actually made it worse. And a lot of times, I think for all of us, it's hard at times to admit that um, sometimes the more that we put our hands on things, uh, the worse things to get. And I'm not calling this a let's quit, call it quits kind of a, a message, but uh, I think there's a lot of truth that can be said in that regard, that there are times that God says, let me and we have a hard time letting God. And uh, we keep trying things and, we can't, and we're, not, we're not learning, we're not growing, we're not grasping who he is in a clearer way, but we're, what we are doing is making things worse as, uh, uh, as we struggle with it. I also found this obvious, obvious, obvious truth quite uh, humbling. Uh, most, if not all, of what we consume first came from the ground. Now, we live in a, a culture today that there's very little raw product that is unfortunately eaten today. Um, let's look at the back of your box of cereal and see what all is in even cereal. Um, but ultimately, everything starts from something raw. And uh, I don't want to get caught on the tangent of, of my uh, uh, all natural <laughs> that I know I've shared before. Um, but nonetheless, pretty much everything, because we don't have the means to make nothing out, only God can do that, make something out of nothing. Uh, God does that, we cannot. And so ultimately everything that we, that we wear, everything that we consume, everything that we eat, everything that we are living in, you know, the, the structures themselves, all that we enjoy today started from raw material somewhere. And uh, is it not kind of humbling to remind ourselves, and this goes for the farmer to uh, whatever industry that we are working in, that uh, all that our life depends ultimately on six inches of topsoil and steady rain is uh, the boil down to what our necessities are of, of life when you consider uh, that raw material that we often become uh, dependent upon. First Corinthians chapter 1, Paul reminds us of, of ministry and our need for dependence. I have these verses here, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Isn't it interesting how things of the Lord and those who stand for him are viewed as foolish to so many? But it also seems to me that often, even within Christianity, the more educated or smart that we believe ourselves to be, uh, the farther we fall from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Uh, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world, confound the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world, to give on the things which are mighty. Now, it doesn't necessarily have any connotation to the size of our biceps, uh, but it has a, a, the, the reality of, of authority, the reality of, of uh, a political or social might in, in that regard. And God has chosen the weak things of the world, to give on the things which are mighty, and the base things, uh, literally of, of low birth, no lineage of the world. And the things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and the things which are not. You know, as Gentiles, those three descriptions are directed towards us, as Paul is speaking to the church there in Corinth. Uh, the base things, 
as a Gentile, we don't have the lineage. We are not of the offspring of, of Abraham. We are considered base in that regard. We don't have that lineage. We are ultimately, especially coming off of the Old Testament time frame, uh, as Gentiles, we were those that were despised. And certainly in the view of the Jews, especially in Old Testament time frames, if you were not a Jew, if you were a Gentile, you were viewed as a, a barbarian, as one who was not. But it's amazing to me that God, in using those three, has brought to naught the things that are. As he's writing to a, a church in the middle of, of Greek culture, kind of the hybrid there in Corinth of all the roads coming through Corinth, and uh, kind of being a, kind of like the United States of America, a hybrid of, of cultures, uh, a melting pot of sorts. And, and Paul is writing to them and reminding them that God chose the base of the spies, the things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are. And I'm even just considering the church. But here's the reasoning, that no flesh should glory in his presence. What a reminder it is of our need to be dependent upon a God so that no flesh would glory in his presence. A little over a week ago, if I can tiptoe quietly around some politics here, uh, I was listening, actually I logged into the Senate floor camera as they were debating this $1.9 trillion rescue plan. And uh, only 9% of it obviously going towards COVID release. Uh, the rest of it being spent on pet projects and, and whatnot. And uh, for starters, I, wish, I kind of wish I could do my budget that way. Wouldn't it be great if we could do our budgets this way? Uh, let's try to, you know, let's, let's say, for instance, and this is the case, our budget is pretty tight as a, as a family and, and uh, as we have different things budgeted out. And uh, let's say this week our furnace went out. Uh, I would hope at this point we're close enough. I know no, perhaps in the future, but hopefully close enough that we could make it <laughs> without a furnace at this point. Uh, but if our furnace went out, certainly we would have a need for, let's say, $3,000 to get a new furnace, whatever it might be. Uh, uh, money that we would not have. And so we would have a family meeting and discuss how can we do this. You know, what, what can we do to raise this $3,000 uh, uh, to have this furnace? And, and how, how will God do this as well? Well, what if in our meeting we decided that, you know, what we would also like is a, uh, uh, you know, we could get rid of a couple of these older vehicles and get another second a really nice vehicle so you know we could throw in you know we need three thousand for a furnace but let's throw in another you know we'll say sixty thousand to get a brand new vehicle truck just and i would like a truck so we're gonna throw in a sixty thousand dollar truck and the girl say you know well we've got some tuition coming up and and so that's gonna be what uh, a good hundred thousand uh, let's just throw that into the mix as well and and uh, uh john says you know what i could really handle uh uh, she's got an amazing piano in, in our upstairs, but you know, we've got it downstairs too. We could have another piano down there, and uh, let's throw in another 10 grand for a piano. You know, can you imagine if everybody budgeted that way? And so, here, because we need $3,000 for a uh, 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 furnace, and now we're spending well into the $200,000, range because we have this. Well, that's ultimately what they were doing and did do, uh, unfortunately. And as I was hearing them discussing the, which had really no monetary expense involved, but the trying to convince themselves that they needed to raise the minimum wage as part of this relief plan as well, uh, I was getting quite frustrated. In fact, there was a few times that I hollered at my computer, what are you guys thinking? <laughs> In fact, I think I texted or uh, uh, emailed Joe and say, I'm listening to this and it's driving me nuts. I had to vent a little bit to Joe. Uh, well, this is crazy. They, they're, they're saying things that they don't, I don't know that they know what they're even meaning or, 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 or talking about it in this case. You know, I think some of the times, and again, I'm not trying to, to cast shame or blame on anything, but I, I think in Washington, I think in a lot of government houses across our nation, while people may be viewed as foolish and weak and base and despised, uh, the truth is, is many times in those in political uh, uh, positions, they're, they've fallen far from what God has called us. Uh, and, and what a reminder that, that our usefulness for our God is not because of who we are, but our usefulness for our God is because of who he is. That no flesh of glory in his presence. When we look at this, pick up here in, in Numbers chapter 21, and let me give you a quick review from 
Number 13, we've reviewed this several times, but let me read one more time. Number 13, the spies have returned. 10 out of 12. 12 months to spy on Canaan. 10 were bad. 2 were good. Remember the whole song? Uh, Caleb and uh, Joshua give their report of we can do this, and then the other 10 do the no can do speech. The people result in mourning and crying out, and we can't do this. Numbers chapter 14, verses 6 through 9 says, And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of uh, Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes, and they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we have passed through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. But the very next verse says, But all the congregation bade stones, or bade stone them with stones. Numbers chapter 14, verses 11 through 19. May Moses and Aaron again have a time with God, because God wants to destroy them, wipe them out again. Verse 20 of Numbers chapter 14, God hands down the judgment, which we know the children of Israel didn't like. They would not be allowed to now enter. They would be wandering for 40 years, uh, basically dying off until the children at that time frame were adults to enter into that promised land. And in Numbers chapter 14, well, even let me read verse 25. It says, Thou the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwelt in the valley kind of as a parenthesis there, and it says, Tomorrow turn ye and get you into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. This is God speaking. But I love that before God's word, wouldn't it be great if this would happen to us? Wouldn't it be great if we could have the narration of our lives where we could have that parenthesis that kind of gives the background and details before God spoke? Well, here, here's how it was recorded for us. Now the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwelt in the valley. There's the, here's what's going on. We could almost say, here's the why of what God is about to say. Tomorrow turn ye and get you into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. Verse 43, again, for the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and you shall fall by the sword. Moses is saying, don't go up. <laughs> Remember, they rebelled and they wanted to go anyway. Don't do it. Don't go up into that land. God's already told us we can't go. The Amalekites and Canaanites are already there. And, and here in verse 43, it says, they are there before you, and ye shall fall by the sword. Because you are turned away from the Lord, therefore the Lord will not be with you. Don't do this wicked thing. Because these two groups of people are there, and they will destroy you. Very next verse, but they presume to go up into the hilltop. Nevertheless, the ark of the covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp. Then the Amalekites, have we not heard this before? <laughs> Then the Amalekites came down, and the Canaanites, which dwelt in that hill, and smote them, and discovered it them, even on to Hormah. Now, as I put my own parentheses in there, I don't believe that this city, this region, has been defined yet. I think we're going to read that here in, verse, in chapter 21. But it's interesting that here's where they are, Hormah. Now jump to today's passage, Numbers chapter 21. And when the king Arad... And it is debated whether or not this is actually a king's name or if it is the king of Arad, if it's a region. And when King Arad and the Canaanite, which dwelt in the south, heard tell that, the Israel, that Israel came by the way of the spies, then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. And Israel vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou wilt indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. The Lord hearkened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them and their cities. And he called the name of the place, what? Hormah. Chapter 14, God says, don't go. The people say, no, but you, we're just going to go now. We are repenting. We're, we're, we realize we're just going to go. Our option is 40 years of wandering, or let's just go now. We're right here. Let's just go. Moses says, no, that's not an option. Do not go. You will get destroyed. They go, and they get destroyed. Where? In a region called Hormah. Chapter 21. Where, where are the Israelites going? I, I don't have my map up here this time. But do you recall as, as they're wandering? Where are, where's, what's, their, what's their pattern right now? Where are they going? They're heading back south to go all the way down to the bottom of Edom and then back up. And, and so their route is already on the the. the, the what are you trying to say? The 
trajectory of heading south, away from the Canaanites and the Malachites. That's their plan. They're not having a plan of going in. They're having a plan of going away, to go around Edom and come in from uh, the east instead of from the south, as they did with the spies, and as they did there in Numbers chapter 14. But obviously, King Azad, or the king of Azad, and the Canaanites don't know what their plan is. They don't know what the strategy is, and so he comes out against them, and he gathers some of them captive. Israel comes before God. God gives them the victory, and in the same location, the tables are turned. Have you ever done something twice and wound up with different end results? I was already mentioning the van. Remember the, uh, the first oil change? I have done all of our oil changes really since we were married. And uh, numerous vehicles that I've changed oil in and, and got it down to a pretty qu quick routine. In fact, especially after we've had a vehicle for a while and so you even know the, the size of, of, of all the wrenches and the bolts and all that are necessary. And so we pull up on the ramps, and I slide under and, and you know, loosen up the, the drain pan plug and drain out the oil until it's about done, and then put it in just slightly and move the drain pan over underneath the oil filter and loosen that up and, you know, get the oil running on your arm, and you throw that in there, let it drip down some, put a new filter in, go back, drain the rest of the oil out, put the plug back in, crawl out, and fill it back up with oil. There, there have been times that uh, I've, I've, I've marveled myself, if I can say it that way, in my own pride, that, you know, I think I'm about as fast as, you know, Jiffy Lube here. Pull up, do it, back in, on the road, and, and uh, uh, on the way. And it all has to do, I'll give you the secret, it all has to do with the right engine temperature. You can't have too hot, or otherwise you'll burn your fingers off when that oil's running. But if it's too cold, it takes too long for the oil to come out. So you just got to have the right, that right oil temperature, and it makes all the difference. I remember the first time with that, the Volkswagen, just that Bridges gave it to us, I did the same routine, put it up on the, uh, the ramps, crawled underneath it, loosened up the drain plug, let it come out, and it was that perfect temperature, so it just came flowing out. When it was down to just a trickle, put the plug back in, moved it where it should be. You know, this is basically a, uh, a caravan, it's a Dodge Caravan uh, that has been altered by Volkswagen and their name on it. They've kind of put another extra amenities into it and put their own nameplate on it but it, ultimately it's a it's a it's a chrysler engine and chrysler transmission and uh even chrysler fluids are recommended for it um but nonetheless so i go we've had dodge caravans before i slide right exactly where i know that filter is the oil filter is and i reach up where is this thing so i crawl in on there and i just say go get me a flashlight so he runs and he gets me a flat and i'm like where is that oil filter? And I'm reaching up there. I'm reaching up where I can't see, and I'm trying to get up. You know, I, I've got to probably be tickling the top of the engine block by this point because I'm reaching up in there. Where is this thing? And again, it's my pride. I know that Ed knows exactly where this, this is, but I don't want to be the guy to say, where's, where's the oil filter? Where? Because I, I, you know, I'm not a rookie here. I've changed the oil for for 25 years plus, and and uh, I've 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 done numerous kinds of vehicles, and and in fact, when I worked for Cherokee, they paid me to change the oil in their vehicles, and 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 I've done this before. I can't call Ed and say, where did they put the oil filter on this thing? So I get out the book, you know, and now you've got oil all over your hands, so now every page that I'm on has got my little mark on it, my, my fingerprint. You're flipping through, and, and uh, they give you these basic descriptions that are assuming you already know where the oil filter is. And I'm thinking, I don't already know where the oil filter is. And I pull out the oil filter. Ed even gave us an extra oil filter. So I pull out, I'm looking at it, I'm thinking, you know, it's not like some sort of funny Volkswagen thing here. It's you know, normal shape, size. It's more papery than what I'm used to, but you know that thing's on the top of the engine block? What are they putting oil filter on the top of the engine block? I'm down there looking all over the place. I've done this so many times, it should be here. It's on the top. Got it, and I had to take off all this plastic stuff, and there it is there, and pull it out and change it, and kind of shake my head that how in the world you know, my 10 minutes is now long gone. We're getting close to an hour here, and I haven't found this oil filter. And well, finally, we're getting done, and somewhat frustrated. And 
uh, kind of blew my record here. And, you know, the very, you know, so many thousand miles later, pull the drain plug, drain it out, put it back in, slide over, reach up. I remember that it wasn't where it was supposed to be, but where was that? Where did it? Same thing. You know what, it, what, it, what is crazy about the routines of our life is we just expect everything to always be the same, do we not? You ever, have you ever followed the same recipe? And I'm not, don't raise your hand because I don't want to embarrass anybody, but I'll say I've done this. You follow the same recipe and you can't tell it's the same recipe? <laughs> this tastes so different this time than it did last time, or it looks so different this time than it did last time. Well, here we have a scenario where they are ultimately running into the same event back to back with 40 years in between them. They are right back where they were once before, 40 years ago, and now the exact same people who in their mind are thinking, we've, what, we've whipped them once, we're going to whip them again. And I've got to think in the children of Israel's mind, we have been destroyed once, we're probably going to be destroyed again. And we get in this routine of, this is how things go, and this is therefore how things will always go. And, and the problem is, is that in that kind of thinking, we are leaving God out of the equation. Because while God is not one who changes, he is still one who surprises. And isn't that a reality of our lives? Uh, how often that happens. So look at, look at some differences very quickly. Number chapter 21, verse 1. Their objective, and one king Arad, the Canaanite, which dwelt in the south, heard tell that the Israel came by the way of the spies. Then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. That is contrasted to what happened in Numbers chapter 14, verse 40. After verse 39 of Moses saying to them, don't go. God will not be with you. You will be destroyed. Why? Because the Amalekites and the Canaanites are in the land. They will destroy you because God is not with you. Verse 40 says, And they rose up early in the morning and get them into the top of the mountain, saying, Lo, we be here, and we will go up into the place which the Lord hath promised, for we have sinned. In other words, we acknowledge we were wrong. We don't want to go follow through with the punishment of our wrong. As a child, remember doing this, and I think I probably mentioned this when we were in Numbers chapter 14. Remember as a child when you, you disobeyed and you knew what the punishment was and you did a quick, well, I'm sorry, and, and it was in the back of your mind or maybe in the front of your mind, maybe in the entirety of your mind, you hoped that simply saying that you were sorry was enough to avoid the consequence of, of whatever penalty is because of what you did wrong. Well, almost as if they are children here saying, we know we've sinned, but we're here. Let's just go. Ultimately, their first interaction with this very same group of people where the focus was, was me. Their objective was me. I don't want the punishment. I don't want to wander for 40 years. I don't want to die in the wilderness as we've been told we are all going to be doing. I don't want to have to leave. Here we are. You know, Caleb and Joshua say we can do this. We realize now that we were wrong in our thinking and our actions. We realize now that we were wrong in trying to stone them because of what they said. You know what? Maybe they are right. Let's just do this thing. We're right here. Let's just go. Their objective was all about me. But in verse, chapter 21, verses 1, and ultimately verse 2, but I've already read these verses, what was their objective? Their objective wasn't about getting what they wanted. In fact, their objective, and probably unlike what the King Arad and the Canaanites were believing, their objective wasn't even to go into the promised land at this point. They've wandered now for 40 years. They paid the price. These are now the children of those that have died in the wilderness in the last 40 years. They know that here they are back where they were 40 years before, but that their plan is not to go in here. Their plan is to go south around Edom. Their plan is to go farther away from the here to come back around, to come in from the east. So their objective is not about themselves and their convenience and what works best for them, but their objective already in verse 1 is obviously clearly following what the Lord is doing. Not saying they're doing it perfectly, not, certainly not saying they're doing it uh, without sin. I would dare say there's probably still murmuring coming up. Certainly that takes place seemingly throughout their wanderings. But they're following where God is leading them. They have learned a lesson to this point. 
And so their objective has gone from, this is about us, we don't want to have to go, we don't want to have to travel, we don't want to have to die in the wilderness, we're here, we are here, let us go. To, well this is awfully convenient, we could literally, we're right on the edge of the promised land, we literally could just march right on through, but we've learned that we follow God and let's not do it on our own. Yeah, I'm not saying that they get that, that they have that solidly in their lives and that from this point forward they will never stray. But in this moment, their objective is obviously focused on their God. It is not a, what about us? It is not a, I don't want to travel 147 miles around Edom. It's not a, you know, we're just going to go through Edom just because. It's a lot closer. Or it's not even a, we're just going to head straight north and go because we're right here. It is a, God says we're going, we're going. We're heading south. Their objective, very different. Numbers 14 to Numbers 21. What about their strategy? Verse 2. And Israel vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou wilt indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their city. In contrast, Numbers chapter 14, verse 40. Again, they rose up early in the morning and they got themselves on the top of the mountain saying, Lo, we be here. We will go up into that place which the Lord hath promised, for we have sinned. Very next verse. And Moses said, Wherefore now do ye transgress the commandment of the Lord, but it shall not prosper. Here is their simple strategy. <laughs> we've, we've already sinned, but maybe if we can uh, disobey again, it'll make, you know, another wrong will make it right. You know, there's a, in fact, we recently had to do this. I, I don't know why our van keeps coming up in the conversation, but our, our, our turn signal uh, went and so you turn it on it's it's the flash blinky and uh i can quickly tell from the the shadows that it's our it's our, our rear it was our rear right blinker but we were in peoria when this went bad and uh, i know that uh, they're not as lenient as they are say in stark county so suddenly i'm learning how to do left hand turns to go right if you make enough left hand turns you can get right without using your right turn signal and, and so this is working out for me and uh, because I, especially if I have a suspicion that there's going to be any police, I don't want to get pulled over in Peoria because my blinker's out. And I had the bulb. Actually, we had already had the bulb in the van with us, but it was during that stretch. Remember when it was, remember, remember when it was so cold? <laughs> it was in that stretch. And, and, you know, it's when you're outside for three minutes and your fingers start falling off. And I'm thinking, I'm not, I'm not changing the bulb here now. It's not working. It just started not working. I have the bulb, I have what is necessary, but I really would rather just make extra left-hand turns to avoid a right as opposed to getting stopped and uh, basically having my hand forced, uh, basically being lazy and comfortable is how that was working out for me. Well, you know, the, the, the thing is here in their strategy is that if they can make another wrong, maybe it will turn into a right. Well, you know, you could do three left-hand turns and it does turn into a right. But what they're trying to do is make two left-hand turns. And the only thing that two left-hand turns will do is what? Get you going backwards. So they made two left-hand turns, and instead of going far forwards, they're going now backwards. And that becomes very clear, that, but that's their strategy. We know that we have sinned, but we also know that Moses is saying, don't do this, but in our meaning, in our thinking, in our kind of planning this out in our minds even though we have sinned and now we have a punishment and Moses is saying if you do this you are going to sin in our mind we're going to justify that this second area of disobedience will be all right because it will accomplish what we should have done in the first place we will go into the land that God has said we should be going into isn't the ultimate objective to obey God and he wants us to go here he's given us this land so let's just do it and we're going to make two left hand turns and we're going to assume it's going to make it right well, it made it wrong. It made it worse than wrong. And they paid that price and then still wound up having to go 40 years of, of wandering. But their simple strategy, which sometimes is our simple strategy, we know what God has for us, and we've sinned in running from it. But now we have to, we have to fix that. We've got to straighten that out. We've got to get back to where we ought to be. But instead of taking the, the right path, we want to take another left path. And assume that as long as, you know, the end justifies the mean. As long as we get to where God wants us in the first place, how we got there it really doesn't matter at this point. Let's just get there and be, be done with it. Well, there's a lot of times that God has yet many more instructions for us to learn. Maybe 40 years of wandering, of learning, 
before we try this again. And two left-hand turns don't make a right. That was their strategy back in Numbers chapter 14. Look at their strategy in Numbers chapter 21. And keep in mind, I don't, I don't know how to put this in either of these two points or the objective of their strategy, but notice something else that was different. In Numbers chapter 14, they are the aggressors, right? The only reason why they have any means to go in when they've been told not to is because, well, they're going to do it. Numbers chapter 21, what's different? The king, the Canaanites, the Malachites have come to them and literally have taken them, some of them, captive. If there was ever a time in your own defense that, that you could justify going into the promised land ahead of God's time, would it not have been this time? You are outside of the promised land, and you're minding your business. In fact, you're on your way. You've just buried Aaron, and you're on your way to head back south to go then north to make it into the promise. You're taking a long route to where you're going. That's already established, and the people of the promised land have pursued you in the middle of the wilderness to destroy you. And they've taken some of you in, back into the promised land. Would not that have been a time where you'd say, all right, this is, this, is, this is justified. We can go in, we will get to our people, and we will come back out and continue on our journey around Edom. This is a justified moment where we can enter into the promised land and do what needs to get done because they have some of us with them captive back in the promised land. That would be an easy justification, would it not? Would it not also be an easy justification to say, that's just what has to be done? I'll tell you right now, if, if uh, somebody came in this building right now and took any of my kids, really any of you, but especially my kids, um, and, and they went into a, 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 they went wherever, I would not call the police department and ask if I have permission to pursue. I'd probably call the police department and say, hey, here's what happened. But I let them know, I'm already in pursuit. I am already, I am the dad, if it's one of my kids. I am dad, and I am in hot pursuit here because they have my child, and I will do whatever is necessary to get that child back. I'm not waiting for the police. I'm not waiting for permission. I'm not going to wait for uh, a, a prayer meeting. <laughs> I'm just, you take my child, I'm coming after you. I, I want my child back, and you can't take my child from me. That's what's happening in Numbers chapter 21. But look at verse 2. Israel vows a vow unto the Lord and says, If you will, then we will. You notice how their strategy has changed? And how our strategy at times needs to change? Same scenarios, basic scenarios, but very different results because their strategy is very different. One was, I'm going to make another left-hand turn and assume it's going to get me right where I need to be, even though they've been told it's not going to work. This strategy of all times, they had the justification, in my opinion, to just go. They have captives of my descendants. Let's just go. No, but they stop and they, they consult the Lord and say, if you will do this, then we will do this. Where's their dependence? What's their strategy? Their dependence is on God. God, we need you so that we can. And what a change of strategy. What a change in outlook. Had they said that in Numbers chapter 14? Things would have been very different. Lord, we're not going to go in until you do. Then we will. You take care of this, we will follow thereafter. We will follow in obedience, but we need you first. That's what the strategy of verse 2 is. A strategy that was certainly missing in Numbers chapter 14 as they pursued what we want. Notice their order, also in the same verse. Kind of, I, I come and combine those two with that last point, but in verse 44 of Numbers chapter 14, but they presumed to go up to, onto the hilltop. Nevertheless, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp. Their first attempt was, was without God. Their first attempt was without Moses. Their first attempt was without Aaron. Their first attempt was without the Ark. Their first attempt ultimately was just their attempt on their own. Their order here in Numbers chapter 21, again, verse 2, Israel vows a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou wilt indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. 
Their order is, God, you go first, we follow. We will wipe them out if you go with us, you say. <laughs> Isn't that what they said? Mm -hmm. But rather, if you will, then we will. Now, there's a lot of things on our journey with, that Christ has already accomplished, and frankly, we still find ourselves waiting. He did, <laughs> but we still have not. We can say it that way. There are a lot of things that Christ already accomplished and has given us, all right, now, so I did, now you do, and we still wait in waiting, as if we're waiting for Christ to do a little more so that we can now do what we're supposed to be doing. Uh, the, the song that my wife sang, uh, just a reminder of the significance. In fact, that might be my, my theme verse for, uh, yeah, for Easter. Remind us of the significance of Christ being risen, what that means for us. Since he did, now here's what we do. And, and, and so we have that same scenario of number chapter 21. He did, now we do. But there's a lot of things that we step back and say, well, we know that you did, but we haven't yet. And, and, and we need to have that understanding as far as the order goes. But we can't reverse that either and say, I want, and I hope God keeps up with me. Stop forcing God for our agenda. Stop demanding that God do more because we've already made the move. Stop justifying our disobedience by calling it zeal. I'm just on fire for God. You can't stop me. I'm just going to keep going. No, no, no. Wait, 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 wait. Time out. If God does, then we will. And obviously the very different objective, very different strategy, very different order, which led to a very different outcome Verse 3, And the Lord hearkened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them and their cities, and he called the name of the place Hormah. Compared to Numbers chapter 14, verse 45, Then the Amalekites came down, and the Canaanites would dwelt on that hill, and smote them and discomfited them, even unto Hormah. Those two words, smote them and dis smote, is a word that often I think could be defined as killed. Smote, it's killed. Uh, but the Hebrew word here, smote and discomfited them, are really, in essence, two words, not necessarily meaning that they were killed, but it leaves that door open of the possibility of death. But it literally are two words that have the idea of, of literally being beaten very badly. And so they had a pretty good smackdown there in Numbers chapter 14, even onto this place called Hormah. Or as what I'm going to say, even on this place that will later be called Horma. But as Moses is writing this later, he knows the place <laughs> because he's already lived Numbers, or Numbers 21. At the same time, he's already lived Numbers chapter 14. And, in, and Moses is making it very clear as he's recording for us the events, as he wrote you know, the first five books, he's recording for us these two events knowing that they happened undoubtedly in the exact same spot. And in this place of great victory for the nation of Israel, that because of that great victory, because of the great uh, 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 the destruction that they accomplished because of God, we are calling this place Horma, which has that idea of vast destruction or utter destruction. They're calling this place because God did this, this name. But ironically, it was the same place that they fell 40 years earlier. And there was a reason that the place of destruction would be to their demise in Numbers 14, but to their great victory in Numbers 21. It had to do with their objective. It had to do with their strategy. It had to do with their order. God, you go first. We follow. We've got to stop demanding that God keep up with us. We've got to stop demanding, even in our zeal, that I want to do what I want to do, and I just expect God to come right alongside of me and take care of all the rough edges around. No, let us follow after our God. Let us pursue after him. And they journeyed, verse 4, and they journeyed from the Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom, and the soul of the people was must have scourged because of the way. Well, it doesn't take them long from a victory to go right back to discouragement. But I'm thankful for three verses that remind us of great victory and the way that it is accomplished. May we learn to do the same in our lives. What's my objective? 
What's my strategy? What's my order? Is it be first, God follow? Or is it God you do, then I will do? God you lead, I will follow. God you accomplish, I need your might, I need your strength, I need your help. But I'm willing to be your vessel in this process. But we've got to have that kind of dependence because it really does make a difference. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you again for your word. I thank you for the example of the nation of Israel, two same, similar places, 40 years apart, but how much has changed in their objective and their strategy, even in their outcome. And we thank you for that. Pray that we live that out in our hearts and our lives as well. We understand the need to be dependent upon you. Be able to call the foreman, so to speak, when our, our thread first gets tangled. And have that dependence upon you first. And I thank you for what you will do in our hearts and our lives as we learn to depend upon you. As we learn to yield our lives to you. As we learn to offer our bodies as living sacrifices to you. As we learn to put you first in our life. As we learn to die to ourselves. As we learn to mortify our own members of our own bodies before you. And we thank you for what you will do as a result. I pray that you challenge us with the historic event of the nation of Israel for our life today in 2021. And we thank you for what you will do. In Jesus' name, amen.